four years. That's how long it's been since the last Transformers movie hit the screens. And now, just in under 30 days, we will be finally getting another that has the potential to be the best one yet. Transformers Rise of the Beast has been a long time coming for us fans, especially after the film's release date was pushed back an entire year. It's crazy to think that this film would have been out 10 months ago if everything went according to plan. But here we are now, with the film right in our grasp, and among all the hype and anticipation, there has been one question I see constantly pop up. That being if this film is a prequel to the groundbreaking and iconic 2007 Transformers movie directed by the one and only Michael Bay, or if it's a reboot that will be a stepping stone in a long line of fantastic films to come. Now, some of you guys are probably already yelling at your screen saying that the movie's a prequel or that the film's a reboot, and some of you might already be typing your answer down below as I'm speaking right now. But the truth about if this film is a prequel or a reboot is complicated. It might be one, it might be the other, Heck, it could even be both at the same time. With that said, I want to dedicate this video to thoroughly breaking down whether this film is a prequel or a reboot, since one day the filmmakers will say it's a prequel, and then the next say it's a reboot. And this cycle of tit for tat has been going on for nearly five years now. So it's no wonder why people on both sides of the debate just want to have such a simple question to be answered by the studio. So with that said, allow me to take you on a journey discussing the question that Paramount does not want you to know the answer to. This one is going to be a confusing one, so I'm going to do my best to walk you guys through this, and hopefully at the end of the video we can all come to a conclusion that the majority of us can agree on. So without further ado, let's jump right into this train wreck. Stand down! I won't ask a second time. Alright, so to figure out if this movie is a reboot or a prequel, we first need to understand where the idea of a Transformers reboot came from. And to do this, we're going to need to take a trip all the way back to the year of 2015. You see, after Age of Extinction grossed over $1.1 billion at the box office, landing itself as the highest grossing movie of 2014, Paramount knew that they had a winning franchise on their hands. And after seeing what Marvel was doing with their cinematic universe, in addition to noticing that DC was following suit with their extended universe, Paramount wanted a slice of that juicy cinematic universe pie for themselves. And so on March 27th, 2015, Paramount Pictures negotiated a deal with Akiva Gold hiring him to create a writer's room with the intention of building a cinematic universe for the Transformers movies. Over the next few months, Goldsman went on to hire a number of writers to help him flesh out the universe. Many ideas were thrown around in the writer's room, such as a sequel to Age of Extinction, a movie set in World War II called Operation Skyfire, and a movie set in Victorian times called Transformers Nights. These three film concepts would be fused together to create the script for Transformers The Last Night. Some other ideas that spawned from the writer's room was the idea for a Bumblebee solo film and an animated Transformers prequel film that would explain the origins of the Transformers. As we know, the Bumblebee solo film idea became the 2018 Bumblebee movie, and the animated prequel film, which was recently revealed to be Transformers 1, is set to come out on July 19th, 2024. Whether or not it will still be connected to the Bayverse is yet to be seen. Now, during this time, everything with the writer's room was going well. And around seven months after its formation, the film concepts for Transformers 5, 6, 7, and 8 were created. Everything was going according to plan for Paramount. They had a multi-billion dollar franchise on their hands with a writer's room that could literally print them money by writing out countless sequels. Nothing could stop the money-making machine that was Transformers, right? <laughs> Well, to Paramount shock and surprise, Transformers 5 was a disaster, with it going on to make the studio lose over a hundred million dollars. Now, there are a lot of reasons why The Last Night failed at the box office, and this is something I plan to cover in a future video. But one irrefutable fact that almost everyone seems to agree on is that this film was terrible. 
The story made no sense, the Transformers barely appeared in it, and it shattered all continuity with the four previous films. Hardcore Bayverse fans such as myself couldn't even stomach this film, and its box office numbers showed. So it's no wonder why on July 31st, 2017, the day production began for Bumblebee, it would be revealed that the movie's summer release a date of June 8th, 2018 would be pushed back to December 21st, 2018. Though it was never confirmed if the last night's box office numbers made Paramount push back the film, it's highly likely that it was, since on February 16th, 2018, Hasbro would reveal something very very unfortunate for fans of the live-action movies at their investor preview at Toy Fair. Hasbro stated that a new team at Paramount would reset the Transformers live-action movie series following the release of Bumblebee. In addition to this statement, we would also learn that Hasbro and Paramount took down Transformers 7 from their release schedule. And this moment right here is when the whole idea of a Transformers reboot came to fruition. Now, you might be wondering why Hasbro and Paramount did not cancel the Bumblebee movie. And, well, the reason why it wasn't shelved like Transformers 7 and 8 was likely largely in part to the film going into production just 41 days after the last night released in theaters. Now something that is very interesting about the Bumblebee movie is that it started out as a prequel to the 2007 Transformers movie, but later ended up becoming a reboot for the franchise. You see, partway through the production, the director of the Bumblebee movie, Travis Knight, pushed for turning the film into a reboot since the story that he wanted to tell was just not going to fit within the Bayverse continuity. And because of his input, the disaster that was the last night's box office, and Hasbro's plan to reboot the films regardless of how Bumblebee did, the folks at Paramount came to the conclusion to grant Knight his wish. And when the movie came out, fans went absolutely bonkers over the opening scene. We now finally got a full-length battle sequence on Cybertron, which is something that us fans thought we would only have gotten in our wildest dreams. Dreams. Dark of the Moon only gave us a taste of what a battle on Cybertron could be, but the Bumblebee movie took that and dialed it up to 11. We also got all of the bots and cons sporting designs that were faithful and accurate to their Generation 1 counterparts. And the story itself was a lot more character driven and was all about a Transformer instead of a human for once, which is something that we've all wanted from day one. If it wasn't for Knight's push to turn the film into a reboot, we wouldn't have gotten all the sick G1 designs in addition to the amazing sequence on Cybertron. And if you're curious on what would have happened if Knight did not push for these changes, feel free to check out my video talking about the original version of the Bumblebee movie that we never got to see. Now, almost half a year after the Bumblebee movie hit theaters, we would get some insight behind Knight's decision to turn the film into a reboot, thanks to an interview Travis and I had with MoviePhone discussing the Bumblebee movie. When he was asked what about the mythology the Transformers films had already established, this is the first time Bumblebee has been on Earth and just one movie earlier, we saw him killing Nazis in World War II. What was your thinking behind wiping the slate clean? Knight had this to say, Continuity is very important to me, as is being consistent. And so I did take a good hard look at the films that had been done in the past. And as we were thinking about this movie, I still wanted the movie to be self-contained. I didn't presuppose any familiarity with the films or the franchise. I wanted someone who wouldn't know anything about the Transformers to be able to sit in the theater to watch this movie and have a good time and enjoy the movie, not knowing anything about the Transformers. But that said, it was important to me that if we were living within this universe and this mythology that it be consistent. At some point, we realized that we were essentially boxing ourselves into a corner, that we were making choices that weren't really in the best interest of the film, if we were trying to kind of sit within the overall mythology of the franchise. Once I talked through some of these things with the producers and with the folks at Paramount, at some point we made the decision that this was the story that we're telling, and we have to talk the best where we can. And if that means that we essentially are restarting the franchise, and that means we're rebooting these characters, and that we're taking aspects of the franchise and putting a different prism on it, then that's what we had to do. And ultimately, it was a liberating choice, because then we weren't cornered into these decisions based on what had come before. We could tell our own story, and that was the aspect of that. So yeah, there you have it from the man himself. Due to continuity and wanting to tell a story that any person could jump into regardless if they were a fan or not, Knight was able to reboot the saga. So then, with Rise of the Beast being a direct sequel to Bumblebee, it has to be a reboot, right? Well, this isn't as open and shut as you might think. 
And it's all because of the Megatron problem. You see, on April 4th, 2019, Travis Knight had an interview with Entertainment Weekly to talk about how he almost had the leader of the Decepticons appear in the film. In the interview, when talking about the opening scene on Cybertron, he stated, I had this whole thing boarded out myself where I had Megatron in there. He comes into the scene just absolutely leveling stuff, just laying waste to everything in his path like Sauron in Lord of the Rings. We had a new design and a partial build and everything. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to do it. But then as we started going through, it was going to be too expensive and really did fly in the face of continuity with the Michael Bay films. But let's be honest, I'm sure they had a fleeting sense of continuity themselves. Now, if we take a second to digest what Knight is talking about here, he is telling us that the reason why Megatron was cut from the film was due to A, being too expensive, and B, not lining up within the continuity established with the Bayverse. Now, A does hold some merit since the Cybertron scene was a last minute addition to the film. However, this then begs the question of why Knight didn't explore alternative means of incorporating Megatron into the film. And well, to our knowledge, he actually did think of at least one. In the Entertainment Weekly interview, he would go on to say that he thought about adding a glimpse of Megatron from the outside of the war room, where the Sector 7 agents were wondering what they should do with the Decepticons. But he didn't move forward with this idea since he wanted the film to work for someone who didn't know anything about the Transformers. And this makes sense since nonchalantly having a giant robot frozen in the Hoover Dam, without any explanation at all, was not going to work for a casual viewer. However, I don't believe that this is the full story. As we know, Knight really wanted to have Megs in the film, to the point that he personally drafted up the storyboards of Megatron on Cybertron, in addition to having the ILM modelers work on a brand new CGI model for Megs. So you would think he would have tried to find some other way to incorporate him into the Cybertron scene. And well, the second reason he gave might give us a clue. That reason was that adding Megatron on Cybertron would break continuity with the Bayverse. Now, this reasoning on its own doesn't make any sense, since based upon his testimony from the movie phone interview, his whole goal with the Bumblebee movie was to turn it into a reboot. So then why would he all of a sudden care about maintaining some level of continuity with the Bayverse at the expense of not implementing something into the film that he really wanted to see? Well, I don't think this issue of preserving continuity with the Bayverse came from Knight, but actually from someone else. Though Knight seemingly had creative control over the film, allowing him to disregard what happened before in the Bayverse, it seems evident that he was limited by how far he could go. In the Entertainment Weekly interview, he mentioned this, I couldn't wait to do it. But then as we started going through, it was going to be too expensive, and really did fly in the face of continuity with the Bay films. Now, it's not stated who this we is that Knight is talking about here. However, we know that Knight had to talk to the producers and Paramount about turning the film into a reboot. And by that metric, any major change that he wanted to add to the movie, such as the addition of Megatron, would have to be approved by his superiors. Which makes sense, since they were the ones who hired him to make the film, and were the the ones who were going to finance it. This is why the issue of the scene being too expensive came up, since the producers didn't want to go over budget. And this decision on their end makes a lot of sense, since during the production of the Bumblebee movie, the last night's poor box office numbers lost Paramount over $100 million, which made them shelve all upcoming Transformers film projects. So, of course, they didn't want to put up even more money for a sequel that they didn't have much confidence in. Now, as we know, Knight really wanted to have Megatron in the film. So we can infer that after his initial pitch was shot down, he likely brainstormed several other ways to have Megs in the Cybertron scene that wouldn't be as expensive. However, as we know, this didn't end up happening and Megatron never starred in the film. But why? Well, I believe that the producers prevented Knight from implementing Megatron into the film the way he wanted to, because they got cold feet when it came to making the Bumblebee movie a full-blown reboot. As we know, one of the issues the producers at Paramount had was maintaining continuity with the Bayverse. The addition of Megatron on Cybertron would have made it evident to audiences that the Bumblebee movie was in no way, shape, or form connected to the Michael Bay films, since in Bayverse continuity, Megatron was frozen at Sector 7 since 1934 
so having him appear on Cybertron in 1987 would officially make the Bumblebee movie a reboot. Now, alternatively, if Knight chose to go with the idea of adding Megatron into the Sector 7 base, which allegedly was an idea that got so far into production that an end credit scene for it was made but never used, would then allude to the fact that this film was more of a prequel to the Bay films. However, as we know, Knight chose not to do this and decided to leave Megatron out of the film entirely, which put the film's continuity with the other five up in the air. So then the question is, why would the producers allow Knight to make the film a reboot, but not let him go all the way with it? Now, unfortunately, it's impossible to know the answer at this time, since no official word has come out. But based on everything that we know so far, here's my best guess. I believe that the decision to allow Knight to reboot the film was a reactionary response by the producers, prompted by Paramount's loss of over $100 million. It's no secret that the domestic box offices for the Transformers films continue to decline after Revenge of the Fallen. And now, with the foreign almost dropping off by half since the previous film, it was evident that something had to change if they want to stop this downward trajectory. So with the selling power of the Bayverse no longer longer looking bright, they allowed Knight to disregard the continuity that had come before, since regardless if the film was going to be a success or not, a new team at Paramount was going to reset the Transformers live-action movie series, right? Well, for some context, around six months after the last night's box office concluded, Hasbro held their investor preview event at Toy Fair 2018. During the event, Hasbro stated that a new team at Paramount would reset the future direction for the Transformers movies after Bumblebee. And this was all the information that we got on this besides Transformers 7 being removed from the upcoming list of movies. Based on these actions, it appears that a reboot for the Transformers movies was going to take place after Bumblebee. Now, it's impossible to know how far these talks of a reset went, since information on what this team at Paramount was planning on doing does not exist publicly. However, based on what we know, there must have been some backtracking on the idea of a full reset, since the producers did not want to fully break continuity with the Bayverse. As to why this backtracking happened, I speculate that when this new team at Paramount looked into the possibility of starting fresh, they looked at the financial side of things, and noticed that every single Transformers movie besides The Last Night generated them millions upon millions of dollars in profit. So, if certain changes were made to the Bayverse, it was possible that it could once again become the money-making machine that it once was. Furthermore, I'm sure they took into account that this was a franchise that they had put together over the span of 10 years, with it becoming a cultural phenomenon. So, throwing all that hard work away and opting for a clean slate must have presented an incredibly difficult choice. And so, I believe that they took the middle ground, having Bumblebee be different enough to the point that it could work as its own separate universe, while still having enough elements from the Bayverse that could allow it to still overall fit within its continuity. And this is the reason why I believe that the producers wouldn't allow Knight to have Megatron on Cybertron. Now, after the Bumblebee movie was released, for the first time ever, a Transformers film was praised by fans and critics alike. And after audiences saw the several creative decisions to distance the movie from the Bayverse, everyone and their grandma wanted to know whether this film was a prequel or a reboot. And well, several interviews were conducted with the various filmmakers of the film. And this is where we fall into the realm of contradiction, so bear with me. One of the earliest interviews that came out after the release of Bumblebee was on January 3rd, 2019, between Metro and the infamous Transformers producer Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, discussing if the end of Bumblebee ruins the Transformers 2007 movie. In the interview, Metro pointed out to Lorenzo that Optimus and the other Autobots landing during 1987 does not line up with the first Transformers film since that movie established that Prime and the Boys first came to Earth in 2007. In response to this, Lorenzo had this to say. That doesn't contradict anything we have said before. Who's to say that they haven't been around robots in disguise since then? That scene was always imagined but in many different versions. We didn't do that scene until we shot the movie, because we felt the movie was going to dictate that scene a little bit. What happened is that you got to see Haley return to her family. Bumblebee needs to return to his family. Otherwise, what happened to poor Bumblebee? That was our thinking. Plus, Optimus said that we are going to Earth, we are going to regroup, and then we are going to go back. In our minds, they went back. 
It had nothing to do with the other films, and was completely about the emotional journey of Bumblebee. Now, despite Lorenzo's explanation making no sense whatsoever for various reasons, such as the Autobots not having a way to leave Earth after they landed in 1987, which is actually a major plot point that's being used in Rise of the Beasts, this was unfortunately the best explanation that we got. However, everything would change around a month later at New York Toy Fair 2019. You see, on February 16th, 2019, Hasbro held their product presentation panel, and a very important piece of information that they gave was that the Bumblebee movie was officially declared as a new storytelling universe. Which in other words meant that the Bumblebee movie was in fact a reboot to the Transformers film franchise, officially putting an end to the Bayverse, right? Well, on March 15th, 2019, Lorenzo had an interview with a Japanese movie news website, where he stated that he was currently overseeing the scripting of two Transformers film sequels, saying, One is the latest in the main family series following Transformers The Last Night and the other is a sequel to Bumblebee. Now, this statement from Lorenzo spread like wildfire among the fandom, since it made absolutely no sense, because a month prior Hasbro stated that they were rebooting the franchise. So, with a sequel to The Last Night now supposedly in development, would mean that the reboot was no longer happening, and that the sequel to Bumblebee would have to end up being a prequel to the Bayverse, right? Well, wrong. You see, this would all be contradicted just three days later, since Lorenzo had an interview with GameSpot where he stated, the main Transformers movie that we are working on is a reboot. And I will say that the Bumblebee sequel will be more directly linked to the timeline that we set up. Now, after hearing this, fans were ecstatic since finally the word reboot was coming out of Lorenzo's mouth which ultimately contradicted all of his previous statements about Bumblebee being a prequel and The Last Night getting a sequel. Now, this reboot language from Lorenzo wouldn't last long since he would unfortunately go back to his old tricks. You see, on March 23rd, 2019, Japanese entertainment magazine The River sat down with Lorenzo to talk about the future of the series. When The River asked if Bumblebee was a reboot or a prequel, Lorenzo laughed, saying, That's a good question. It's actually a spin-off. Since it's set in 1987, it is a story before the past works of the series. That is, it is not a reboot or a remake. It's a story before it starts. So we can fill in the gap between 1987 and the first Transformers movie. Now, after fans heard this, they were absolutely livid and did not know what to think. But pretty much everyone agreed that anything that Lorenzo said had to be taken with a massive grain of salt. Like, a devastator-sized one. Lorenzo is the core reason why this whole prequel or reboot debate has been going on for years. As a producer, his words are supposed to carry weight, but when they constantly contradict each other, it's impossible to make out what's fact and what's cap. Now, 12 days later, on April 4th, 2019, Lorenzo would have an interview with Slash Film. When he was asked, are you developing a script that picks up where the last night left off, Lorenzo responded with one word, no. Now, if this statement was true, was impossible to tell. But the same day, Travis Knight had an interview with Entertainment Weekly about how Megatron almost appeared in the Bumblebee movie. And four days later, on April 8th, 2019, Knight had an interview with Movie Phone discussing how he convinced the producers at Paramount to turn the Bumblebee movie into a reboot. And from here, that was kind of the end of the testimonies that came from the filmmakers on whether or not the Bumblebee movie was a prequel or a reboot. And from this point on, us fans had to piece together the puzzle ourselves, with the very contradictory information that we had. But the common consensus that most of us came to was that the Bumblebee movie was a reboot, due to the fact that the continuity did not match up with the lore that was established in the Bay films, the fact that Travis Knight talked with the producers and Paramount to turn the film into a reboot, and the fact that Hasbro said that the Bumblebee movie was going to be the start of a brand new storytelling universe. Now, of course, not everyone agreed with this standpoint, and some felt that the Bumblebee movie was in fact a prequel. And since then, us fans are still arguing whether or not the Bumblebee movie is a prequel or a reboot, all because of the conflicting info that was served to us on a silver platter. However, things started to change when the first Rise of the Beast trailer dropped on December 1st, 2022. You see, the trailer presented several plot points to us that did not logically line up within the Bayverse, such as RC being on Earth in 1994 despite the Bayverse telling us that she first came to Earth in 2009, and the introduction of the Maximal and Terracon factions, which were never brought up at any point during the Bayverse. However, there was one Bayverse connection that was present. 
that being Optimus having the same face as his Bayverse original trilogy counterpart, which is something that I personally love since I grew up with the Bayverse. Now, though based on the trailer, it was evident that this film was leaning towards the reboot direction. However, we would get official confirmation of whether this film was a reboot or a prequel from the director himself, Stephen Cable Jr., in an interview that he had with the YouTube channel Black Girl Nerds. And if fans know where Terracons come from, then they know, they know what to expect. Um, but yeah, I feel like we have to un a lot to unravel because this feels like a, a true reboot, if you will, into the Transformers franchise. So we're about to see a lot more beyond the Decepticons moving forward. So there you have it. The director himself said that the film felt like a true reboot. So then everyone had to be on the same page right? Well, for a time, that was the case, until Lorenzo D. Bonaventura had another interview. On April 24th, 2023, Lorenzo sat down with Collider for an interview on how Rise of the Beast differs from the Michael Bay movies. And during the interview, he said this, At the end of Bumblebee, Optimus comes to Earth. What he's experienced is failure. Probably for the first time in his life, right? He's had to retreat. He's leaving the planet Cybertron. What's happened to him from that experience? When we met him in 2007, he's a particular person, if you would. In 1994, he's not the same person. He still has growth to do between 94 and 2007. So the character arc for Optimus in this, and the fun for the audience is, when you first meet Optimus, and we've had this experience because we've watched it with the audience, and we've heard them talk about it. They're like, it's definitely Optimus, but there's something a little different. At first, they're like, wait, what, who? What Optimus is this? And by the end of the movie, Optimus has become the guy that you recognize from the Bay movies. Emotional. Now, though many fans knew that Lorenzo's track record of statements has been very contradictory, it didn't stop the whole reboot or prequel debate from being thrusted right back into the limelight. And the same day, more evidence to support the film being a prequel would emerge, since images from issue 337 of Total Film Magazine would surface. The magazine had a whole section that was dedicated to Rise of the Beasts. And one paragraph that stood out to fans was this. The film is set seven years after Bumblebee in 1994, before the events of the Bay movies, which means Optimus Prime and the other Autobots aren't quite at the comfort levels they've reached with humanity by the time they strike up a relationship with Shia LaBeouf. Now, now, for some fans, this was the smoking gun that proved Rise of the Beast was not a reboot. However, something that nobody seemed to take into account was that this quote from the magazine was not said by any of the filmmakers, and instead was written by the people who wrote the magazine. And we know this since anything that was said by the filmmakers was placed in quote marks, which this section clearly doesn't have. However, an interesting piece of information that did in fact come from a filmmaker would be this quote from Lorenzo. If you said it any time after Michael Bay's movies, you are forced into one reality. It's not easy to juggle the lore of the Bay movies and then somehow insert this other piece of it. Eventually, if we're lucky enough to get there, we're going to be forced to marry them. But for the moment, we don't have to. Now, this statement from Lorenzo is particularly interesting compared to his past statements, since he would either say that the film was a prequel or or a reboot. But now he's saying that it can be both? Based on his testimony here, it appears that currently the film is a reboot, but if it becomes popular and spawns sequels, it will end up becoming a prequel? I'm just as confused as you are. Now, remember Lorenzo's statements about how the Optimus that we see from Rise of the Beasts will turn into the Optimus that we all know and love from the 2007 film? Well, that statement would be undermined when the second Rise of the Beast trailer dropped. And in the trailer, we got the reveal of Unicron. Now, this was a big deal, since this Unicron was completely different to the one that we saw in The Last Night. You see, in The Last Night, Unicron was our planet Earth. However, in the trailer, the Unicron that we saw was his own separate entity. Therefore, there was no way that these two Unicrons were the same, which meant that Lorenzo's statement of Rise of the Beast Optimus becoming 2007 Optimus was impossible, since 2007 Optimus was connected to the Unicron that was Earth, while Rise of the Beast Optimus was connected to the Unicron that was his own separate entity. Now, despite this clear impossibility, some fans would theorize that the machine that we saw the Terracons use would end up turning Unicron into the core of the Earth, thus keeping continuity with the Bay films. However, this theory makes absolutely zero sense. Since Transformers The Last Night told us that Unicron was always the Earth, and his horns were spread around the globe when the supercontinent Pangaea broke apart. So, with that said, the fact that Unicron is going to be his own separate entity in Rise of the Beasts would make it absolutely impossible for it to be a prequel to the 2007 movie. And more information 
information to support this would surface on May 10th, 2023. You see, director Stephen Capel Jr. sat down with The Hollywood Reporter to talk about Rise of the Beasts. When he was asked, so I will assume that the movie will contextualize things for the casual moviegoers who last saw Bumblebee. But what do they need to know going into Rise of the Beasts? Capel had this to say, you don't need to know much. If anything, Bumblebee got here in 1987, along with Optimus Prime, and they've tried to seek refuge on Earth until they can get back to Cybertron. Ultimately, all you need to know is that they're trying to get back to Cybertron. If you can go into this movie knowing that piece of information, you'll be able to track it completely. It doesn't mess up any of the timeline in 2006-2007. We're actually going in a direction that allows us to protect that side of the universe. Now, in essence, Capel's statement here implies that Rise of the Beast is a reboot. By emphasizing their commitment to preserving the established timeline of the Bay films, it becomes clear that they are taking the reboot route, since by having Unicron in this film as his own separate entity would fly in the face of Bayverse continuity. But with this film being a reboot, it wouldn't negate that problem and allow them to keep the Bayverse timeline intact while having a brand new interpretation of Unicron appear. Now, the same day this interview was posted, Paramount uploaded a video to their YouTube channel that gave some information about some of the characters that were set to appear in the film. And in the video, Capel said something that sparked some confusion with some fans. In chronological order, this is the second Transformers movie takes place during the 90s, shortly after Bumblebee. With him using the word chronologically here, some people thought that Capel was saying that Rise of the Beast was the second movie in the entire live-action film franchise. Now, I highly doubt this was the case, because this was a video on Paramount's YouTube channel that was made to appeal to the general audience, and not to us fans. By Capel saying that Rise of the Beast is chronologically the second film, helps people who aren't in the know about this film being a reboot, understand that the five Michael Bay Transformers films are not a required viewing in order to enjoy this film. This approach was crucial since without this clarification, potential viewers who are unfamiliar with the franchise or have limited knowledge might have been discouraged from watching the film, assuming that they needed to catch up on the previous installments. Now, as of the time of this recording, there hasn't been any other pieces of information stating if this film is a reboot or a prequel. However, if we take into account the information that I shared today, which to my knowledge is every piece of information on the topic of whether Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast is a reboot or a prequel, I wholeheartedly believe that it's abundantly clear that Transformers Rise of the Beast and Bumblebee are in fact a reboot. And I come to this conclusion since every single piece of information I provided besides anything mentioned by Lorenzo stated that Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast are part of a new rebooted continuity. We had director Travis Knight tell us that he pushed for turning the Bumblebee movie into a reboot. We heard from Hasbro on two separate occasions that the reboot was going to happen. And now we have Stephen Capel Jr. telling us that his film is a reboot, with it being a direct sequel to the Bumblebee movie which was also confirmed to be a reboot. Furthermore, if you take a look at this from a a continuity standpoint, Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast don't line up within the Bayverse continuity, with the two most egregious examples being that 1. Unicron was the Earth in The Last Night, and in Rise of the Beast he's now his own separate entity, and 2. The Last Night telling us that Bumblebee was on Earth during World War II while in the Bumblebee movie he made Planetfall in 1987 after Optimus told him to establish a base. Now, the only way that I can see Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast potentially work as a prequel to the Bay films is if The Last Night was disregarded entirely. But then again, there are still some problems with continuity. So yeah, there you have it. Based on everything we know, Transformers Rise of the Beast has to be a reboot. Now, if you're down for some more Rise of the Beast content, check out this video where I break down the second Rise of the Beast trailer frame by frame.